Hello students, we're going to do a little note taking on cell transport section 7.3. We don't have a digital handout for you for this for this section, but, uh, but trust me, this is going to be easier for you to write them by hand. We're going to take about three pages of notes, which sounds daunting at first, but the second and third page are actually going to be very little writing. It's just going to be a couple of flow charts. But in order for the notes to be smooth and for them to be organized on your paper so they can be organized in your brain is we want you to make the flow chart ahead of time. So what I want you to do is um, anticipate we're going to take about three pages of notes. The first page will be on your traditional line paper. That's just mostly going to be text. But the second and third page, we want to be able to turn the landscape style. So you're going to make your flow chart ahead of time. So your first flow chart is going to look something like this one. Very carefully copy down these ovals, copy down these arrows, and yes, write in these transitions. So the whole thing is going to go on. So here's the entire flow chart. That's going to go on one page. So you can just get a sense of how big you should draw your circles. You can take a moment and pause the video here to draw this section. Do that now. All right, unpause. Now you can pause the video here to draw the bottom section. Unpause. All right, so now you have the first flow chart drawn, the second flow chart. Here's the top half of the second flow chart. Again, pause on a second sheet of paper, draw this. Unpause. And then here's the bottom half of that flow chart. And you can pause it here. All right, so now you have your two flow charts set up ahead of time. So then when we transition to the notes, to the flow chart part of the notes, you'll have them ready to go. I also have printed copies of them in front of me, which I printed at home, which I can show you to kind of give you direction about where we are and what portion of the chart we're in when we're taking those notes. All right, let's jump to it. Alright, so, cell transport. Oop. I tell a lie. Let's go to the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. There we go. Let's try this again. Alright, excellent. Cell transport. So this is the portion of the notes you're just going to take on lined paper so you can write it out and it's nice and organized. Section 7.3. Uh, nothing to write here other than the title. Here's just a picture of a couple of cell membranes. Here's inside one cell. Here's inside another cell. And here and here are pictures of two cell membranes. All right, so cell transport notes. Cell membrane. Oh, by the way, if at any point you find that I'm talking too fast, too fast again, it's just easy for you to simply pause the video, finish the writing, and then resume. So the cell membrane is a thin, flexible barrier that surrounds all cells and regulates what enters and exits the cell. It defines the boundary of the cell, so by extension, the boundary of life. Um, the, cell help, the cell membrane helps the cell maintain homeostasis. And that's just internal biochemical balance. It's biochemical happy land. It's, not, it's like Goldilocks is uh, not too hot porridge, not too cold. Bed's not too hard, bed's not too soft, it's just right. Homeostasis, steady state, internal stable conditions. The cell membrane also provides protection and support for the cell. Defines the boundary of the cell, protects it, supports it, lets things in and out. The fancy phrase is selectively permeable. The cell membrane is selectively permeable. This means that it allows only certain substances to pass back and forth when needed. Some stuff can get out, some stuff can get in, some stuff can't get out, some stuff can't get in. Selectively or choosy permeable. Cell membrane structure. The cell membrane is actually two layers. So the wrapper of a cell is actually two layers, two very tightly packed layers. That's called a lipid bilayer. So two layers of phospholipids. Here's a space filling model of what a phospholipid look like. Uh, you know lipids better as fats, oils, and waxes. So a lipid has a phosphate head, which is polar, which means it has a charge to it. 
which means that it can bond with the polar uh, nature of the water molecule. It also has two fatty acid tails. Now these two fatty acid tails are nonpolar, so they're like vegetable oil or canola oil. And we all know that oil and water don't mix. So this is the part of the phosphate phospholipid that doesn't like oil. There are proteins embedded in other docking stations and other chemicals embedded inside the cell membrane. The next slide, we're going to zoom in and see what a cell membrane looks like up close. So again, if you feel I'm talking too fast, pause it, get the writing down, and then unpause. So there's just an image of the lipid bilayer. There's a cartoon or simple drawing of the, of the phospholipid head and tail. All right, so nothing to write here. Just consider the graphic before you just move on. Consider the graphic. Uh, here is the outside of the cell. Here's the inside of the cell. Here are our phospholipids. So here's the phosphate polar head that can orient itself to water. Here's the lipid tail that doesn't like the water, so these tails turn inward. So now we have the two layers where the tails are turned inward. So this is a non-water-based environment here, but outside the cell we have water, and inside the cell we have water. And then these are various proteins and channels and docking stations and other molecules that are embedded in the cell membrane. It's a very dynamic organelle, very dynamic cell part. These things move around. Um, the cell membrane is it's flexible. It's not static. It's uh, highly active. All right, now we're going to turn our attention to our flow chart. Right. So now here's the very first one you made. And I know it's kind of small as I zoom in on the screen, but, but here's the very first one we made. So we're going to put, it's in, what you see in yellow on your screen is what's going to go in here. And we're going to start by moving to the right side of the flow chart. So we're going to move down this right side of the flow chart. Then we'll come back and we'll go down the left side of, we'll go down the left side of the flow chart. All right, so. Cell transport, that goes in that top circle, and then cell transport can be passive, it right? can be passive. So we're moving to the right here, and in that second oval on the right-hand side, we're going to write the word passive. What does that mean? It means that it requires no energy. Passive transport requires no energy. This type of tra transport moves materials from high concentration to low concentration. What exactly does that mean? It moves it from where particles are more crowded to where they are less crowded. Naturally, particles want to move from where there's more to where there's less. Um, just a few simple examples. Think about, like, um, I don't know, like perfume. Uh, you spray perfume or cologne on your clothes, and the idea is it's in high concentration on your shirt, it drips off of your shirt or off of your skin in the area around you where it's low concentrated. So you can, get, you, so you can smell it and so you smell nice. Um, or if someone's cooking in the kitchen, when you walk home from school um, and someone's been cooking in the kitchen, the whole house smells maybe of your favorite meal. Well, all those food molecules that started in high concentration in the kitchen, maybe it was the oven, and, and now they're drifting out to fill the hallway, the living room, the bathroom, the landing, the doorway. So those molecules are moving from high concentration to low concentration. Particles naturally want to move from where it's more crowded to where it's less crowded. This doesn't require any energy. All right, so now I'm just going to hold this up for just a second. This is a copy of the flowchart that you made. There's a copy of the flowchart that we've made. And we were going down uh, the right-hand side. Now we are on the inside of the right-hand side. We're on the inside of the right-hand side, then we're going to go to the outside of the right-hand side. All right, so one type of passive transport is referred to as diffusion. Get my face out of the way there. So again, the yellow is what goes in the ovals. Diffusion. This type of transport moves nonpolar, meaning uncharged particles, solutes through the cell membrane. Just recalling from ninth grade physical science, solutes are things that are dissolved inside the liquid, the solvent. All right, so passive transport, one type of passive transport is called diffusion. 
diffusion move non-charged, non-polar molecules through the cell membrane. Nothing to write here. This is just a simple animation. And I'll start here in just a jiffy. Oh, I guess that one wasn't working. All right, so for a split second, you'll see all the red ones concentrated here inside the cell membrane. And then they start to move out until they're evenly balanced. And notice once they're, once they're evenly balanced, once it's the same concentration of the red particles on the inside as the outside, they don't stop moving. They're still moving. They're just moving back and forth. All right, so this is not requiring any energy, meaning it's not burning any calories. The particles are going from where they're more concentrated inside that cell membrane to where they're less concentrated outside the cell membrane until they reach what they call equilibrium, where it's balanced. And then they're still moving, they're just moving back and forth equally. All right, so now we're on that far right side where you wrote down the second type. A second type of passive transport is called facilitated diffusion. To facilitate means to help. All right, so in our first type of passive transport, diffusion, the particles are nonpolar, which means they're not charged, and generally they're pretty small, which means that they can fit through those tiny little bits of the phospholipid cell membrane. Some particles have a charge to them. They either have a negative charge or a positive charge. And they can't just pass through the cell membrane, so they have to pass through these open channels, these little gates that help them go through. So it's called facilitated diffusion. All right. This passive transport, this moves. So now we're in this big circle here at the bottom. Right. Oh, sorry, let me get it straight here. <laughs> so in this big circle here at the bottom. This type of passive transport, this type of passive transport moves large polar charged molecules, large or polar charged molecules through molecule-specific transport proteins. Again, what does that mean? I know that's a lot to write in that circle, but it's also why we make it big. Molecule A, that is large and or polar, meaning it's got a charge to it, moves through the transport protein that's only good for molecule A. Molecule A can't move through a transport protein that's for molecule B. So embedded in the cell membrane are all these channels, docking stations, and gates that allow certain molecules to move back and forth. And again, that's what we mean by being selectively permeable. So we have, large, we have small, uh, non-charged particles that can move through just pretty much anywhere through the cell membrane, and then larger and or polar molecules that can move through these docking stations, these little channels or gates. Again, it's, it's facilitated, so it's helped, but it's passive, which means it doesn't require any calories. The picture we saw earlier, here's a transport protein. There might be other transport proteins embedded in the cell membrane. Again, just a couple of examples. Here is our regular diffusion. These particles are small and they're non-charged, so they can move right through the cell membrane. These particles are either larger or they've got a charge. They've got a positive or negative charge, and these blue ones can't move through the cell membrane, so they have to move through this docking station. So again, just both types are of transport or diffusion. This is, or, sorry, both types are a type of passive transport. This is diffusion through the cell membrane. This is facilitated diffusion through a helper channel protein or gate. Nothing to write there. Again, here's just another example, a carrier protein that's moving these particles from high concentration where it's more crowded to less concentration, or it's less crowded, or low concentration. All right, so lastly, so now we're on that bottom oval on the right-hand side. Osmosis is the facilitated diffusion of water. Back to this water business. Because water is so important, it gets its own special treatment or its own special kind of diffusion called osmosis. And that water moves through these aquaporon channels, 
in the cell membrane. We'll come back to that a little bit later. All right. Again, there's just an image, nothing to draw there. But water is highly polar. It's really little, but it's polar. Water molecules can't get past these phospholipid. They get repelled by these tails. So here is a aquaporon molecule that allows these water molecules to move through. All right, so now we're going to go back to the top of our flow chart. All right, so again, here's our flow chart here. We just filled out this side, meaning this, these two columns. Now we're going to go to this side. So now we're going to fill out the left-hand side. Which the cell transport we've already written in. We've written that at the top oval. Now we're going to move to the left. Right? Cell transport can be active, which is the opposite of passive. It can be active. And if passive transport requires no energy, then it makes sense that active transport requires energy. And specifically, we mean, we mean burning calories. It takes calories. That's what we mean by using energy. So again, the yellow is what goes in our ovals. Right? This type of cell transport moves materials from low concentration to high. So now we're going from where it's less crowded to where it's more crowded. We're going from where it's less crowded to where it's more crowded. This is sometimes called going against the concentration gradient because particles naturally want to go from where they're more crowded to where they're less crowded. That doesn't require energy. Active transport is the opposite of that. We're going to go from low concentration to high concentration. We're going to go from where it's less crowded to where it's more crowded. Now we should be at the part where our flowchart branches into three different, where it states three kinds. So we have three kinds of active transport, right? And they should be numbered one, two, and three from left to right. Uh, one is endocytosis. Just making sure that my flowchart match, matches my map. Endocytosis, exocytosis, and protein pumps. Oh, two seconds here, students. I want to make sure that I'm yep. So endocytosis is the one on the far left. Endocytosis is the one on the far left. Endocytosis, and again, this moves large or charge molecules into the cell. Endo means in. So it Again, we're, it requires energy, we're burning calories, and we're taking large molecules into the cell. Sometimes, oh, I'm sorry, from low concentration to high concentration. Endocytosis, into the cell. Uh, this picture here, nothing to draw here, just want to show you, uh, explain what this is. So here's a single-celled amoeba, which is a uh, single-celled protozoa that lives in fresh water. So this is all the amoeba. And then this little thing in here is called a paramecium. This is actually another kind of single-celled living creature. This amoeba, which is just kind of this globular mass, has surrounded the paramecium. So all of this is a bilipid cell membrane. This is also the bilipid cell membrane. So it's kind of wrapped itself around. And then this cell membrane is going to break off. And then that poor little paramecium is going to be in a phospholipid capsule inside this amoeba, and the amoeba can eat it. So that's how you would bring in a large particle into a cell, endocytosis. And here's just a cartoon image of what's happening there. Uh, these, this is an actual white blood cell attacking a bacteria cell. Of course, bacteria cells are not naturally yellow, and white blood cells are not this pretty blue. Uh, this the colors have been added by computer so we can see it, but this is literally a white blood cell attacking some infectious disease. Down the middle, exocytosis. This moves large molecules out of the cell. Exo means to exit. Large molecules out of the cell. Oh, we've missed one. Starting back up. So, exocytosis, large molecules out of the cell. Here's the bottom. Both exo and endocytosis have materials in vesicles, basically little bubbles, that fuse with the cell membrane. And that's what's being illustrated in this video clip here. Uh, 
Let's keep going. Protein pumps. Protein pumps. Pardon me, students. Sorry about that, students. I got uh, I got interrupted by my get interrupted by my uh, by my kid. All right, so let's get rid of this. Let's go back to presenting. I apologize. All right, so let's just back up a little bit. All right, so endocytosis, exocytosis. Both endo and exocytosis uh, have materials and vesicles that fuse with the cell membrane. I'm gonna just so what? So here's a cell membrane going out, uh, vesicle going out, dumping this, these materials out of the cell. Last one. So again, this is the third kind of uh, active transport, uh, endo and exocytosis. This last one is a protein pump. So protein pumps move material through protein gates in the cell membrane. Uh, and this is an example of a sodium potassium pump. I'm not sure if this one's going to work in. Let's see if the animation works in this one. All right. So. Uh, a sodium potassium pump is important in, in nerve responses. Um, so what you'll see here is we've got um, the red particles on the outside and the few red particles on the inside. What happens here is we would actually move against the concentration gradient. We would move these uh, red particles out uh, and the yellow particles in. Uh, the point is that it's a pump. It's a pump that's embedded. So here's our cell membrane. It's a pump that's embedded in the cell membrane, and this pump changes shape as these particles move back and forth. Again, this is a kind of active transport. All right, so in summary, for transport, before we move on to osmosis, we have two kinds of transport, passive and active. With an active transport, we have two basic types, diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Diffusion is stuff moving the cell membrane without any help, doesn't require any calories, doesn't burn any energy. Facilitated diffusion is moving stuff across the cell membrane through protein gates that help the charged particles go through, but it still doesn't require any energy. So that's passive. On the active side, we have transport that requires the use of energy. It requires the use of energy because we're going from low concentration to high concentration. Passive transport, we go from high concentration to low concentration, more crowded to less crowded. Active transport, we go from low concentration to high concentration, less crowded to more crowded. Three main types. Endocytosis, bringing large particles into the cell. Exocytosis, bringing large particles out of the cell. And then protein pumps, uh, moving particles across the cell membrane with a pump that changes shape. All right, now we're gonna move on to the last flow chart. Here is the last flow chart. You should have done drawn the second one that should have looked something like that. Something like that. Uh, if you didn't get this drawn, pause the video, note where we are in the video, back it up to the beginning so you can see this up close and draw it, and then you can skip ahead to this part. All right, so now uh, this part up here in white, if you didn't write this down, if you didn't write this down, I do want you to write that down uh, somewhere on the left-hand side, somewhere in your, somewhere in your flow chart. All right, the very top small oval, we're going to write the word osmosis. All right, so this is a kind of diffusion. It's a kind of facilitated diffusion. But because water is so important to cells, it gets its own special treatment with respect to diffusion. All right, so the word osmosis goes right here. Right, I have it typed here, this phrase, which is in white, effects of osmosis on life. Water is so small and there's so much of it, cells can't control its movement through the cell membrane. And then it's in this oval right here that we're going to write, water moves towards the greater concentration of solutes or dissolved particles across a cell membrane. 
That is the ultimate definition. Right? Water moves towards the greater concentration of dissolved particles. If there are more dissolved particles outside the cell, water is going to move out of the cell. If there are more dissolved particles inside of a cell and outside of a cell, water is going to move into the cell. Water moves towards the greater concentration of dissolved particles. All right, so now we're going to move to the far left of our flow chart. Remember, this flow chart has three distinct columns. All right, so when the solute concentration is greater outside the cell, Right, so remember, solute versus solvent. Solute is the amount of stuff dissolved. Solute is the stuff that's dissolved. All right, so when the solute concentration is greater outside of the cell than inside of the cell, right, that's what goes in that first left circle, then, right, so that's our transition word, then water moves out of the cell. Remember, water wants to move towards the greater concentration of dissolved particles. So if there's a greater concentration of dissolved particles outside of the cell, water is going to leave the cell. Well, water is going to leave the cell. This is called hypertonic or overstrength, hypertonic. This is a hypertonic solution. Now this is important. The term hypertonic doesn't refer to the environment inside the cell, it refers to the environment outside the cell, right? So the solute concentration is greater outside the cell. That's what we call a hypertonic solution. So water is gonna leave the cell. A hypertonic solution results in cell dehydration, right? This results in cell dehydration. This essentially is what shrinks cells. This is what dehydrates cells. All right, so here's a, an important graphic to pay attention to, and you might want to add this to your notes or write this in some place. All right, so you'll note that actually every time I move this and get in the way. So in our solution, we have 20% salt in the solutes and 10% in the inside the cell. Because this is a greater concentration of dissolved particles outside of the cell, water is going to move out of the cell. This is a problem that freshwater fish have. Or sorry, that saltwater fish have. Saltwater fish live or are surrounded by water that's really high in salt. So as weird as this sounds, saltwater fish face the issue of dehydration. Here's the cell, here's the cells on the surface of the fish, and then here is the salt water itself. Because the salt water has a greater concentration of particles than the water inside the cell for these fish, water is constantly leaving, water is constantly leaving the, the cells of fish uh, and going into the ocean. So how do these how do these saltwater fish compensate for this? Well, they drink a lot of salt water. They drink a lot of salt water. They have specialized gills. They have specialized gills that, that help bail out that salt. They have specialized gills that help bail out that salt. This is what happens to a plant cell. So here's a plant cell that is in under normal conditions. We're looking under a plant cell underneath a microscope. If you were to put a drop of salt water on it, here's a drop of salt water on it, and what happens is the cell is shrinking because now all of the water that's inside, so here's the cell membrane, this is the cell wall, here's the cell membrane, all the water that was inside the cell membrane has left the cell because water wants to move from, or the water's gonna go for, towards the greater concentration of dissolved particles. Red blood cells. This is what happens when you drink ocean water. It actually dehydrates you. It dehydrates your red blood cells. All right, so now we're going to move to the right side of the flow chart. 
when the solute concentration is greater inside the cell than outside the cell. All right, so now we've reversed it. So now we have a high concentration of salts inside the cell, or solutes, dissolved particles, high concentration of solutes inside the cell compared to outside the cell, right? And remember, water wants to move towards the greater concentration of dissolved particles, so water moves into the cell. This is referred to as a hypotonic solution. So again, remember the term hypotonic solution refers to the environment that the cell is in, not the environment inside the cell. And we really have two different environments. Here's my cell, and I've got the environment inside the cell membrane, and then I have the environment outside the cell membrane. Well, in this case, what we're saying is the solute concentration is a higher concentration of dissolved particles inside the cell than outside the cell. So water is going to flow into the cell. This results in cell swelling and possibly lysis or bursting of the cells. Right? This can result in lysis or bursting of the cells. Again, just consider the graphic. Notice here that now the salt concentration or the solute concentration in the water is very low, right? And the solute concentration inside the cell is very high. So now water is moving into the cells. This is the issue that freshwater fish face. Freshwater fish have a high concentration of solutes in their cells on the surface of their bodies, and they're living in fresh water. So fresh water moves into the fish through the surface of their uh, cells, on the, uh, through the cells on the surface of their body. Um, how do they compensate for this? Uh, by taking on too much water? Well, they don't have to drink water very, very, uh, very often, uh, and they pee a lot. Uh, as weird as that sounds, fish actually pee, uh, and if their pee is, high, is, is really diluted. It's not very concentrated because they're taking on excess water. All right, so what happens if we add distilled water? I don't think this animation is going to work. What happens when we add distilled water to a uh, to blood cells is the blood cells burst. Uh, is it possible to drink too much water? And technically, yes, it is, but it's really, 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 really hard to do. Uh, if you drink a lot of water, uh, most of the time your kidneys just pull that water out, and what do you have to do? You go to the bathroom. So don't ever worry about drinking too much water. All right, now we're going to go down the middle. In the middle, there's Goldilocks, right, when the solute concentration is the same on the inside and on the outside. When the solute concentration is same in, same on the inside and on the outside, water moves in and out of the cell evenly. It's not that water stops moving. Water is constantly moving. Now it's just moving in and out in equal proportions. This is referred to as an isotonic solution. Again, considering the graphic here in this corner, right? 10% salt on the outside, 10% salt on the inside. The water moves back and forth evenly. This is what we refer to as equilibrium. All right, just about done here. Pull myself back a little bit. Go to the next slide. Nothing to write here. Let's just consider very quickly. Right here is an animal cell that's shrinking. Here's a plant cell that's shrinking. Here's an animal cell under normal conditions. A plant cell under normal conditions. Here's a red blood cell that's bursting. Here's one that's it, that isn't. Referencing back to your notes, pause the video for a second and make a prediction. What type of solution are these cells in? Right? Now, again, the solution is the environment around the cell. Go ahead and pause. All right, and let's test our knowledge. This first one, the cells are shrinking, which means that water is leaving the cell, which means that that is a hypertonic solution. The solute concentration, the salt concentration, is greater outside the cell than inside the cell. Water moves towards the greater concentration of solutes, so water is moving out of the cells into the environment. This one doesn't seem to be any change in shape, so this is isotonic. 
the solute concentration is the same as on the outside as is the inside. So water is moving back and forth evenly. This last one, because this cell is bursting. Now this plant cell doesn't burst because the cell wall on the outside of the cell membrane keeps that from happening, but they're both swelled with water. In this case, that means that water is moving into the cells. This means that the solute concentration is lower outside the cell than inside the cell. The opposite of this one, and that is referred to as a hypotonic solution. Oh, that's it. Take the time to review these notes. Take the time to read the assigned pages and answer the questions on the reading guide. Cell transport, by far and away, is the most tricky concept that we cover in Chapter 7. Maybe the most tricky concept that we cover in uh, all of our unit on cells, Chapter 7, 8, and 9. We're going to do a lab, or you, would have, or you have done the lab, the, um, the diffusion osmosis lab. So that lab and those concepts should help reinforce this. Um, but again, this is a tricky concept. Students oftentimes mix up passive transport, active transport, diffusion and facilitated diffusion, endocytosis, exocytosis. It's really easy to get them mixed up. What do I mean by hypertonic, hypotonic? Which way does the water move? Review the notes, review, do the reading, answer the questions carefully, and when the time comes, watch a YouTube video or two. Getting down the, the subtleties of cell transport takes practice. So be willing to put that time in. I hope this was helpful. Any questions, don't hesitate to ask either myself or Ms. Stiles.